Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad, and as always, it's freaking awesome to be with you in the blockchain and crypto space. Guys, today we're going to be talking about part two of an elastic conversation I've been, you know, having with you guys recently because there was an amazing San Fran uh, meetup with Stella, Neo, and Elastis. And in that presentation, Chen Rong disclosed some really interesting information about Elastis, and obviously Dar spoke about Neo, and Jed talked about Stella. So as a result, in the first part we talked about, I spoke about Elastis in terms of what Chen had, you know, informed us about. I explained key aspects about it being a very um, potentially revolutionary um, technology because it's not going to operate on a blockchain. But in that respect, it's actually going to be working in direct correlation with cloud technology, and it's going to also have a payment rail system that Ched and the Elastis team have been working on for five years through a peer-to-peer -peer network. So that's very exciting. But what I wanted to do today was talk to you about that information of Elastis. So I'm going to be talking about Elastis first as a recap, but then I'm going to explore that in the context of the overall enterprise space in China. So what I've done is I've tried to collate a whole series of articles and they'll all be in the links below, but I've collated them into a PowerPoint and I want to unpack that with you. So the idea of this is to explore just how deeply entrenched potentially NEO and Elastis are, particularly NEO, in the overall enterprise and fintech space in China. And I want to also go as far as talk about very, three very serious stakeholders in the internet market in China, and they are called the BAT group. They stand for Baidu, and for Alibaba and for Tencent. So guys, the focus is really unmapping and unplugging some of the sort of mysteries perhaps, um, and, and also to raise questions more than provide answers because I wanna provide you with proof that there's a lot more at play based on the articles that I've put forward in, in terms of the interconnections of the, uh, of the overall FinTech and enterprise space in conjunction with Neo, OnChain and Ontology. So let's get stuck into it. Guys, firstly, if you haven't been across to my website, uh, sorry, the, the YouTube site that I, um, obviously you have if you're watching this, but if you haven't seen all the videos, then go and check out some of the others because whilst I do focus on Neo primarily, I want to explain that I am about blockchain. That's why I decided to call myself Blockchain Brad because I'm a really huge proponent of ecosystems, of uh, structures that have real world rel relevance. And that's why I predominantly focus on Neo because they have, in my opinion, the best architecture, the best network, the best real world um, connections uh, at the moment in terms of blockchain and cryptocurrency design. Uh, and obviously, um, as you know, I, as I've explained before, and many people, including Dar, have also come out and said, Neo is not designed as a cryptocurrency. It never was designed that way from the outset. It was always designed to be a share structure, an asset holding within a very vast network. So, guys, there's some more videos that you can jump in and check out. Um, and oh, one more thing, like uh, soon, uh, hopefully, we'll get to. 4,000 subscribers and um, I'll be organizing some sort of Neo prize. I missed out on doing the 3,000 so I'm gonna play catch up and do that. And the way we're gonna do that guys is through comments. So I'm gonna do a quick in a, uh, search through um, you know, an internet site you can utilize and it's just gonna pop up a few people um, that have commented. So that's how we're gonna do it and then what will happen is I will let those people know and they can just send across their Neo wallet and I'll be throwing some Neo into their account. So. That's really cool. So thank you also because the comments really mean a lot because that's I always respond and we can get a dialogue happening because that's the most important thing I think is that we can uh, evolve to, as a group, as a community and strengthen our knowledge and education. So guys, the next thing I wanted to do is get straight into the presentation. So if we go and start the slideshow, the focus is going to be on Elastis. But in that context, I wanted to talk about a, a bit more about what it is so that we can recap that based on our Twitter feeds from Neo News Today. And then we're going to go across and look at the articles that I found. So first thing to mention is we're going to be looking at behind the scenes, uh, going what the, the, the things going on there. And cloud technology is going to be a focus of the talk. And Yun is the Chinese word for cloud. Just and you'll see why that's relevant as we go on. So to start off with, if we go back to a, just a few facts related to Elastis. Chen Rong, he is the guy who worked for Microsoft for over eight years. He is the key architect of Elastis and he's been working on it for 17 years since the year 2000. His team, um, they translated all the Android Java framework and, they cla and class libraries into C++. And they did that just for one reason, that is for security. So what does that mean? 
Basically, it means that they did that so that they can that that malware and virus attack doesn't happen because they've removed the the um, internet framework essentially from the uh, from the, the the equation in that it won't be running necessarily on uh, uh, like IP addresses for example there'll be no direct correlation and instead they're going to be utilizing cloud technology to run what essentially Elastis is which is an operating system for the future and, and it's going to be doing that with a neo contract a direct conduit to the neo asset. So the C++, as we said, as I have said before, uh, it improves, uh, it approaches uh, previous, applica previous applications, uh, sorry, it prevents uh, applications from having direct access to the net internet. And that's really important. So the dApps won't have direct contact with the internet, rather the dApps will have direct contact with cloud technology. So whilst, you know, there's been comments said about um, essentially the internet is cloud technology, Yes, that may be true, but it's a different modality. It's a different way in which we utilize dApps. It's going through the cloud, not directly through, a, through the blockchain. And that's the key distinction. And they're gonna do that using smart routers. And that, that, that system is called Reflections, which you can look into. And that allows for peer-to-peer -peer interaction as well. Uh, there, there would be no more usage of IP addresses, so that's going to become an obsolete factor, and Elastis blockchain would function as the trust zone. And this is where ontology fits in, because many people are still wrapping their heads around it, but it, it, ontology is not a blockchain. Ontology is an entire fabric. It's, a, it's an interconnected system, much like, uh, for want of a better word, it's much like a, almost like a, sphere, a spherical web of nodes and interconnections. And that what they represent is a business trust functionality and anybody who has a blockchain can plug into that trust mechanism but this is the really cool thing neo has a very special and uh, relationship with ontology and that's because ontology is a key part of on chain it's in that it's an, a private entity directly linked with on chain and the overall architecture of this whole ecosystem involves the three of them so the neo contracts can work through and on ontology for business and that's really important because ontology's premise is not necessarily business it's about providing uh, all kinds of services and, and interact interactivity so it allows for blockchains to interact with blockchains it allows for all kinds of cross capabilities and one of those is obviously going to benefit NEO greatly because NEO is fundamentally about business. It's about trying to be productive in the private and public blockchain space. And that's going to become more apparent as the ecosystem builds. But right now we know for sure that NEO is the public blockchain. Housed inside that is an asset we call NEO. It has a utility function as well via gas. And all of those things interact with ontology. So that's a huge boon and a benefit for the system. So more news about that just before we move into the Elastis talk is that Darhon Fay, when he spoke, he made it very clear about some of the aspects of difference and distinction between Ethereum and NEO. And I'm copying a bit of flack talking about that on Twitter, but the reason why I do is not to disparage Ethereum. And I want to make that really clear because as I said before, I'm pro blockchain and I'm pro ecosystem and I'm pro business because that makes sense in the real world. But in terms of NEO, because I represent NEO as much as possible for free, I still want to make sure I, the facts are clear. And when people compa compare them and say NEO is the next Ethereum or it's like the Chinese Ethereum, we need to clarify that that's not the case. And this is why. The first one, it, it relates specifically to its protocol design. NEO is hinged or, or is based on a third generation delegated Byzantine fault tolerance protocol and that is an unforkable design. Ethereum is going to be moving to proof of stake. It's currently proof of work and what that means is that it's essentially the potential for forking is real and still there. And that in terms of enterprise is so significant that we are seeing the, the, um, the, the, the changeover um, of many projects which essentially are represented by businesses, some of them very big, they're, they're transitioning across, they're making the move across to NEO because of things like that, which is a very real consideration uh, for you know, investment when you're trying to work out which one is you know, not just the best technology but it has a good community and fundamentally it has sound enterprise value. Because again, I'm not trying to disparage Ethereum. I'm very proud of Vitalik. I think he's an amazing genius. But at the same time, we need to be realistic about what the what the current functions are, what they're doing, and how they support business overall as a model for the future. 
of distributed and uh, decentralized technologies. So in the future, Da believes that the world economy will be more transparent and inclusive and it will be easier to establish trust. Again, both of these ecosystems are about trust, but if we go one step deeper and we talk about smart contracts, this is where it gets very interesting. On the one hand, you have Ethereum and their smart contract system is directly appended to their blockchain. So it's a direct link. And inside that, there's two requisites in terms of the languages that you can use. You can use Solidity, which is a very finite and specific language that was created by the Ethereum team, or you can use Serpent. Both of them require weeks and weeks of um, unpacking and exploring the language itself, which is not necessarily you know, uh, so, you know, conducive of a very open system right from the outset. And then if you go across to NEO, it's very different. Their open source plan from the beginning was to utilize common languages. So for example, they can utilize C Sharp, they can use JavaScript, they can use Java, uh, Python's coming, looking at Golang language. So there's all, thing, all these kinds of things that open up the network very quickly for applications to be appended and utilized to the network. But there's one more thing that's exciting in, in relation to this. And that is that applications themselves may not, considering the Elastis connection, may not even have to operate directly on the blockchain, which distinguishes them completely from Ethereum, in that with this operating system, the applications can run on the cloud technology, which, it, which essentially is a reformulation of how the internet's going to be the provision of the future in blockchain decentralization. So Da Hongfei noted also that although many applications are running on Ethereum, many of them don't have that real world application yet and they are fundamentally acting as cryptos, whereby everyone's sort of hopeful of them being of value in the future and thereby the, um, the investments are in, in hope. What Da is saying by that is that there's a much greater focus on real world context for NEO and that's why they don't have a huge number of projects right now because they vet them but there's one other thing that they do that's really cool. They charge companies 500 gas for the, for the initial investment that they make into NEO, meaning that that 500 gas is the cost of put, getting onto the blockchain as a, as a NEO contract. What that means, because it's a substantial amount of money, is that the projects have to be re relatively serious about that. But on top of that, the whole team, the NEO council, work very hard to vet the quality so that we don't see those pro problems we've seen in the past of Ethereum with initially the pre precept of let's just let as many businesses can come on board because we want to try and circumvent authority and become you know essentially you know a, a mechanism for bypassing government governance and systems that at play now that are centralized and what's for sure is Ethereum's changed their tune they no longer do that they've got direct connections to inculcate trust to, to establish trust Neo from the outset have been doing this and they have done that with the with the ontology and on chain in mind. Um, and if you do enough research, you can see that already the structures were in place well and truly for on chain and ontology before we became aware of it publicly. And that's because Neo, right from the outset, had been presented to venture capitalists. Da did this himself with the with the overall um, trust infrastructure in mind, knowing that. The premise was to make it make Neo a business token, to make it valuable in blockchain, uh, public blockchains, in pu private blockchains, and consortium blockchains. And the reason why I say that is because there's a protocol that allows for that interaction into those worlds, which you'll learn more about, called the cross in, uh, the cross chain interoperable uh, Neo X function, and that's going to open up things so much more. So the Ethereum and NEO distinction, again, there are those basic differences and we talked about the, um, the protocol, the algorithm that's important and we talked about um, the, the different um, languages that it, relate to them both. So in terms of just a map, I want to go across to Elastis now and we're going to focus on that for the rest of the talk. Elastis is the centre of this map and it's solely based on Elastis, these interconnections. There's many, many more that you can relate to, all kinds of facets of this. But if we go solely to Elastis, we know for sure that there are definite government links. Absolutely. And that came directly from the Elastis site. The white paper, uh, I read through that, but when you go to all the announcement publications, it's very clear that up until the ICO ban, the government was directly funding Elastis, which is important because remember, their interests are certainly in getting an operating system uh, functioning because they are working to, they are currently working on things like digital currencies. Um, and they are very much invested in blockchain as well. The other thing to note is that Da Hongfei, obviously with the, his diverse roles, he's CEO of two major companies, um, and he also represents LawChain as, uh, as well, um, 
you can see that he uh, I'm sort of making the centerpiece above Elastus. And the reason why is because as I've researched more and more, there's absolute connections, absolute connections with Microsoft and IBM from on-chain. And I have no doubt of that. And because of the interrelationships between on-chain and Neo, and ONT as a trust mechanism between them, there's no question that, that at the very least indirectly, Neo is going to benefit from the Microsoft and IBM connections. No question. Because it's been said many times, but on-chain will not work efficiently without Neo working productively. They are mutually supportive of each other and they, ha they rely on their own ecosystems to evolve. So then we go across and let's talk about some key points. We won't talk about every single thing here, but one of the things I noticed that was particularly interesting is that Hung Feng, he's a very important person to all of this, the bigger picture. He is a Tencent talent um, uh, pool member. So again, that was really interesting because Tencent is the one of the largest companies um, venture capitalist com com companies in the world, and we'll look further into that. They're also heavily invested in cloud technology. So that's why cloud technology is also the center of this map, because it's really relevant to the future of, of in the internet itself. And given that the internet plan that, uh, of Elastis is actually directly linked to the NEO contract, all of this relates to NEO. Um, so Jihan Wu, another person I wanted to mention, he is the CEO of Bitmain, which is one of the largest mining you know, companies in the world, for, um, currently for the you know, Bitcoin uh, and, and various other mining, I'd imagine. He's a proponent of BCH or Bitcoin Cash or other terms you may call it. And the reason why I put him in there is because he was one of the three people who launched Elastis. So that's a huge thing. There's an obvious connection that Jihan Wu has to Elastis. And then uh, he's also, if you go to Han Feng, they are friends. They know each other. They've been involved in certain, and I'm going to show you all of this as evidence. So more of this will make sense. Also, the Lei Jung in green across with the Bitmain, I just mentioned, Paradise Papers is worth a read because it explains some of the connections of this very powerful man in relation to Bitmain, which again feeds back into Ji Wu and Elastis. So there's interconnections that are really genuinely existent um, and they relate all the way up until that bat, which is the Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent, particularly Alibaba. So that's the reason why I put dots from Da Hong Fei up to Alibaba and Tencent because that's piquing my interest. It, it's, there's many indicators through the articles I'm going to show you that do suggest and provide more, more conclusive evidence that this map is entirely plausible. Okay, so if you want to know more, um, just, just ask me on Twitter or ask me through the um, direct feedback below because I'll always respond to that. If you want to know why one chain is with Factum, for example, there's more I could add also with Wranglu Tech and one chain, but essentially it's important that we do this in a really collaborative way so that we don't try and create a FOMO of this, but show you the genuine connections.